Good morning. If you all want to come in and find a seat, make sure you get a handout. We'll get going here this morning. We got a big topic and a little time. Grab your drinks, grab your Bible, <laughs> grab a handout. All right. I have a little bit of a ring going on there. Probably gets of where I'm set seated. Hope everybody's enjoying the weather this week. It's been awesome. Hope everybody's looking forward to Borden Park this afternoon because that'll be fun. All right, the topic of the resurrection. Who here has ever had an encounter with somebody over the topic of the resurrection? It could be a cult member or an atheist or a high school or college professor or somebody like that. You ever have any of those discussions with somebody? The topic of the resurrection is uh, very controversial in the world. And it's very controversial among cult members. Shouldn't be so controversial among the believers, but... So why is the subject of the resurrection so critical? For the believer. Because Christianity is the only religion that has a risen Savior. Exactly. Christianity is the only religion, it's the only faith that has a risen Savior. And virtually every cult in the world, their perspective on the resurrection is that it did not happen physically. True biblical Christianity is the only faith that has a physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, different groups like that. Many of them believe in a spiritual resurrection, whatever that means. I don't know how you have a spiritual resurrection, but uh, that's what they believe. And of course, the world does not believe in a resurrection, physical resurrection at all. They mock it. They think it's absurd. So, have you ever had anybody say, hey, you can't scientifically prove the resurrection? Well, that kind of a statement is kind of absurd because you probably cannot scientifically prove what you had for dinner last Tuesday night. But there's historical evidence, right? Historical evidence might be, um, you know, all kinds of eyewitness accounts. The dishes might still be in the sink. There's legal evidence too, right, Mike? The legal evidence might be all kinds of things like what you had on the menu on the refrigerator and, and there's all kinds of forensic evidence, this kind of thing. So somebody saying that you can't prove the resurrection scientifically is kind of absurd because there's historical and legal evidence. I thought it'd be good to, to get into some of this evidence for us because we, we do have some scripture to look at. I'll probably scribble some more on here. There's more on your handout on the uh, resurrection appearances of Christ. First thing I'd like to look at, because it informs so much of what we're going to discuss here, is if you'll have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll look at the first handful of verses. This is the key resurrection chapter in the Bible. Some people consider it 
the key chapter in the Bible because the resurrection is that significant. And in here, Paul will tell us the reason why the resurrection is so significant. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, just Peter. Then by the twelve, after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep or died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, whom not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But the grace of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. Then also those who've fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who fall asleep. Now, first fruits, first fruits doesn't mean he's the first one, right? Because Christ himself raised several from, from the dead. First fruits means he's the preeminent, the most important, the most significant one. We can look at it that way. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And that's the significance for us with the resurrection is that because he lives, we live, right? So I want you to notice on your chart too, don't miss this when you, when you take it home. There's a little box down here, who raised Christ? It's interesting that all members of the Trinity were involved in the resurrection. In Romans 6, 4, Galatians 1, 1, the Father raised Christ. John 2, 19, it says that Christ raised himself. The Spirit raised Christ in Romans 8, 11 and 1 Peter 3, 18. But then it just says generally that God raised Christ in Acts 2, 24. So that's fascinating. And I want you to, to bear that in mind and keep this handy should somebody come knocking on your door at any time and kind of watch their eyes bug out because that's a tough one for a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon to explain or to get around. And um, you can find these in their, their Bibles is too. Their Bibles too, so Bibles is is. Um, let's, let's take a look at some of this now. What I want to do is I want you to flip back real quick. This is a lot of subject in 45 minutes, so I'm going to kind of pick and choose a little bit. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Um, well, let's see, I'll, I'll, start, I'll read the first three verses. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of 
all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up and after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, the demonstrable proofs, it's tech Miriam, and these are just overwhelming proofs. They're demonstrable proofs. One of the key points to look at when we're looking at the resurrection, though, is not just the fact that there's mention of the resurrection in the Old Testament and that Jesus foretold his, his own resurrection, but there was much spiritual warfare going on. We've known Satan all through the Old Testament and into the New to be doing everything he can to disrupt God's plans. Ever since Genesis 3.15 and disrupting Israel and all the plans all through history, tempting Christ, the resurrection is one of those interesting things where Satan worked so hard through the agencies of his own world government that he establishes through the earth, worked so hard to prevent uh, the resurrection from happening, to try to stop it, to try to thwart it, that it actually compounded and create even more proof than you can possibly imagine. I want to run through the, the death of Christ real quick. And I might rattle off some verses here that you can write down or you can see me afterwards for some notes. Now, the resurrection is the topic for today, but there's some things going up to that having to do with the death of Christ that show you the amount of work that happened to try to um, condemn Christ, try to get him killed, and then once he was killed, try to get him to stay in the grave or try to hide the fact. So, the first thing is the security precautions that were done. Jesus went through six trials. Before Annas, the high priest, and that's in John 18, 13. And then he was taken to Caiaphas. And you can find that in Matthew 26, 57. By the way, if you want to go find the stories, of, the resurrection stories of Christ, where are you going to find the resurrection stories? You're going to find them in the Gospels, right? Just go to the last handful of chapters and there they are. So if there's any, any question, you just flip to the very end of each of those Gospels and you'll have these accounts. And then he was taken before the Sanhedrin in Matthew 26, 59. Then he was taken to Pilate in Matthew 27, 2. Luke 23, 7 records his trial before Herod. And then before Pilate in Luke 23, verses 11 to 25. Notice he had three Jewish trials and three Roman trials. The Jewish legal system was comprised of two different Sanhedrins. One is a 23-member Sanhedrin that tried capital punishment cases. A second was of 71 members that tried cases involving uh, a head of state or a high priest or a case involving the temple. This was probably the Sanhedrin of 23. And they had a, a Sanhedrin in every major city in Judea. So ultimately it was both parties, Jewish and Roman, that delivered Christ to be crucified. And you can find that account of that in Matthew 27, 26. Now, the second thing to look at is the crucifixion itself. So the Romans learned from the Carthagin Carthaginians, and Alexander introduced crucifixion. And the Romans picked it up. So in the crucifixion, they had the custom of whipping which you're probably familiar with and anybody who's seen some of these movies, it's horrific to sit through. Even though you know it's a fictional actor, 
And it's a fictional thing to watch somebody being hit like that with a, like a cat of nine tails and it's woven with beads of bone and rock and whatever else, bits of wood. To watch somebody, their flesh being flayed with uh, whipping in that manner. It's tough to sit through. And then there's the crown of thorns they jammed on his head. There was the crossbar burden he had to carry on his way to where he was going to be crucified. Uh, there was the nails. By the way, Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, it was, he, was, he died on a torture stake. It wasn't a cross. So they had torture stake. They use a, a nail like this through both wrists and the nail through the feet. Well, when you read John, John's gospel account, it refers to, plural, the nails for his hands, which means more than one nail used. And by the way, just so you know, a lot of times artwork or movies will show the nails here in the palm of the hand. The, the weight of the human body cannot be borne on this flesh here because your, your finger bones actually go straight down and then attach further down. So it would tear right off. So unfortunately, it's even more gruesome. They would go through the wrist. In uh, old terms, when they talk about the hands, you're talking about the ends of the arms. You're not talking about, you know, here in, in Western culture, this is the hand, right? It starts from here up, from here up. But for them, it's, it's the ends of your arms. So when he's crucified by his hands, it went through... Uh, a really painful nerve right here. Don't ask me right now what the name of that nerve is anymore. I can't remember what the name of it is. Very painful nerve to go through. And that's how he was crucified. Um, the tradition of breaking the legs was um, something that they did to um, not prolong it longer than about a day. Sometimes they went longer, though. We know the account of Jesus that if they were hurrying the process along. The Jews were really anxious to see the process sped up because they were coming up onto a high holy day. Um, they were in Passover. They were getting ready to start the Feast of First Fruits. That's a high holy day. So there's two Sabbaths that week. You had your normal weekly Sabbath. There's a couple times during the year there are other high holy Sabbaths. They wanted him down because they wanted it over with and he had to, that was the custom, so they wanted him. So they, when they went around then to break his legs, they found he was already dead, right? Then to confirm that he was dead, what happened? You remember the Roman thrust the spear in his side and blood and water came out, separated. That showed that he had died. And there's all you nurses in here probably are aware of the process. When the blood and water separates and it's in the body cavity, like that's a pretty good sign that, yeah, this person's dead. So... That's why blood and water flowed out, and that's why the gospel is so detailed in making sure it lists that, and it notes that. It's, with some people, atheist types, high school, college, professors, whatever, will try to say that, well, he was just swooning. He was passed out. Well, except there was also the fact that they, they wrapped the body. We'll get there. So... In addition to that, the spear in the side, uh, John 19, 34, was also the rock tomb. So Jesus was way dead by all this, and he's, but get him to the rock tomb. They placed the body, the Jews would place the body on a stone table, and you've probably seen this depicted, in a chamber. They washed the body in warm water. And they would use about 75 pounds of different various spices. So they would lay them down on a the cloth. They'd sort in, sift in these spices as they wrapped them. The cloth would have no ornamentation, nothing fancy, no frills, no paintings on it. It was just fabric, just white linen. Couldn't have any stains. It could not be sewn together um, by women. No knots were permitted. So they would wrap them up, and they'd put these spices in. The spice was made up of, uh, would be mixed with myrrh. So it'd be, end up being a gummy paste substance. So you can see how it'd be absurd to claim 
that Jesus breathed through it all, right? He wrapped up in all that gummy substance. Uh, altogether, he'd end up with 100, 110 pounds in that ballpark of spices and wrappings. So he did not breathe through it. He, so he's bundled up pretty good. So they would start at the feet, wrap to the armpits, and put the arms down, and then they'd wrap to the neck. So John 20, take a quick look at John chapter 20, if you would. You've all seen that Shroud of Turin, right? And it shows almost like a photograph of Jesus. John chapter 20, start verse 6. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths laying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So what they did is they walked into the tomb. The rest of the mummified linen cloth was still wrapped up, but collapsed. The linen cloth head wrapping was separate, folded up, and set aside. So it's different from what you see with the Shroud of Turin type of depiction. That's John 20, verse 6 and 7. Okay, after that, they took a large stone, the size of the stone to be um, set in the size of the entrance, they'd use five and a half, four and a half to five and a half feet um, high, and to be a proper thickness that it wouldn't crumble, one and a half to two tons, so three or four thousand pounds stone. They'd have a groove or a trench, and it would be kind of rolled in place, and they'd have a chalk there that would clunk, clunk into place, and then they would often take another chalk and put it, a wedge, into, the, into it so that it couldn't be moved. So what I want to get to now is the Roman security. Um, Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Verses 63 to 65. That's a long chapter. Well, you can start verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that the deceiver said, they're calling Christ the deceiver, after three days I will rise up. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, he's risen from the dead. So that last deception will be worse than the first. In other words, they knew the implications if the body went missing. Now, we don't want that. Let's make sure he stays in that tomb. So this security, we're, we read about a guard there. There's a couple different types of guards. So, so if it ended up being the temple police, they'd be um, 10 Levites in 27 units of 10 are the temple police. If the captain found one asleep, he'd be beaten and burned in his own clothes. The guards were forbidden to sit or even to lean while on duty. Most historians agree that it would be a Roman guard that was used. So the Roman guard, sometimes in a depiction, artist depiction, you'll see two guards, maybe three, standing there with a spear. Well, what the Romans did and what a Roman guard was, that, that depiction is a little bit on the laughable side. Here's what's happened. It was a unit, it was an elite unit, kind of like think uh, in terms of the SEALs or the Rangers. So these were specially trained men. A Roman guard, a Roman guard unit historically was a four to 16 man security force. 
each man is trained to protect six feet of ground. So depending on the opening and how big they were spread out, you had to have a man for every six feet. Historian Dr. Paul Mayer said, 16 would be a minimum number expected outside a prison. Guards in ancient times always slept in shifts, so it would have been virtually impossible for a raiding party to have stepped over all their sleeping forms. So what would happen is, is you had tomb opening here with the stone in front of it. You'd have guards standing in different places. Then what would happen is, is between these guards, kind of in a fan formation around it, heads in, you would have a bunch of guards sleeping, and they would sleep in shifts. So assuming that the disciples, a bunch of fishermen, carpenters, whoever, and a tax collector mixed in there, were brazen enough to decide to raid the tomb, they would have to be powerful enough to overcome an elite Roman force, step over sleeping bodies first without waking them up to get to the ones who are awake and then overpower them. So what do you think the odds of that are? And then after that, we know about the resurrection. The resurrection did happen. The accounts are at the very end of the Gospels. As we said, we're not going to revisit that, but they're at the end of the, all the Gospels, and you know where to find them. The high priest was offered a bribe. Why? Matthew 28. Let's see, if you look at verse 11, you were just in there. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came, not all of them, because he got out, and they're off out running around. They came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole them away while they slept. Now some of these guards took this bribe and they went with it. Well, what's remarkable about that is they're bribing the guards basically humiliating themselves because they didn't do their job if that's the case. They're, they're paying them money to say, well, tell them it is your fault. So they weren't, these guards were not getting the death penalty. They were getting money to go and say, oh, yeah, you know, we got overwhelmed by a bunch of fishermen and they kicked our tails and, you know, the body's gone. So they started this massive disinformation campaign. Now, in addition to that, what else... Satan had in plans, and his plans were as the seal. So to set the seal on the tomb, the Roman guard had to be present. They had to verify the contents. They had to be there, watch the contents, go into the tomb. A cord was stretched over the rock, attached to both ends with a sealing clay, and they'd be stamped with the signet of the Roman governor. So they have a signet, they stamp it there, stamp it there. So it'd be a seal of the authentication as to the contents and to the authority. So contents and authority is what the Roman seal meant. Breaking that seal is a capital crime. It's death penalty. We say a similar story like this in, in uh, Daniel 6.17. Daniel 6.17, we're not going to go there, but... So, he rose on the first day that we call Sunday. We find that in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, all those end chapters in the gospel. It was physical. Um... John 20, Mary hugged him, right? And he said, stop clinging to me. He ate fish. In Luke 24, 41 to 43, you also see that uh, account in Acts 10, 41. Others touched him in Matthew 28, 9, Luke 24, 38 to 40, John 20, 17, all those in chapters. We remember the story of doubting Thomas too, right? 
Thomas says, I'm not going to believe it unless I can put my hand in the hole in his side and I can touch his hands. And his disciples were there again, John 20. Here's, here's what's key. How much time do I have here? Seven important facts to take away from for us, okay? Something happened. Understatement of the year. It was 15 minutes from the center of Jerusalem. The Romans and the Jews outwitted themselves by taking so many precautions because that created a bunch of proofs. All those precautions created proofs. It's all evidence. He had the broken seal, violating the power and the authority of the empire. Consequence, according to law, won't be executed by crucifixion upside down till your guts would run into your throat. Much fear surrounding those consequences. So before you even thought about breaking that seal, you had to think about, oh, if we get caught, you know, the empty tomb, if false, it's easily demonstrated if it didn't happen right there in the town. It was right there in the town. Uh, the disciples proclaimed it right there in the town. They didn't go off. They didn't go run and hide and, and in the tales in other foreign lands tell people, yeah, he rose from the dead. They stayed there in town and they proclaimed it boldly. So it wasn't far away. Both Roman and Jewish historical sources acknowledged the event and bribed people to hide the event that, yes, the body's gone, the body's gone. Tell people it was stolen. Rome could easily have taken the body um, and, and put it on a post by the gates, or they could have put it on a cart, as sometimes they did as a shaming kind of thing, and they could have wheeled the corpse around town. The fact that they didn't do this says a lot, especially knowing the fears of the Jews. Why didn't the Jews do this? Because there wasn't a body to par parade around. It, that would have also quashed the uprising of the Christians, right? Part of the reason some historians say that Rome fell is because of the boldness, the sense of freedom that the Christians had and were spreading around, it was giving them hope, and it created, it was so much of a struggle to contain all that sense of freedom and hope that they had. And some people say that all of that was part of the, what contributed to uprising in Jerusalem and, and uh, the Romans feeling like they had to go into Jerusalem and put that down in, in 70 AD. So all those things kind of came to bear to a lesser or greater degree depending on the historian that you read. The large stone was moved. Now remember now, the stone was one and a half to two tons. The stone was found moved uphill. Hey, here's what happened. This is interesting to me. In Mark 16, it said, Anakuleo, meaning it was moved up a slope or an incline. Okay. Ana meaning, uh, ah on there being, meaning um, away from. So it was moved away. Luke, Luke used apo. Coolio, meaning away from the woman in Mark, women in Mark 16 were amazed someone moved the stone up and away from the entrance. John goes one step further, arrow, which means to pick something up and carry it away. So John's account was like it wasn't just moved and it wasn't just uphill. It's like somebody picked it up and carried it away. So did the disciples tiptoe around the Roman guards and carry the stone away and then go through the trouble of carrying it away and carrying it up a hill and flopping it over? The guard unit, for the most part, went AWOL, which is an instant death penalty. Instead, they were bribed to spread disinformation that should shame and incriminate them, and they took it. Again, that's Matthew 28. Then there's the grave clothes forensics. Miraculously, the clothes were there. There was If they were going to steal the body, then why would they take the trouble of taking the grave clothes off and then what, rewrapping them or whatever? So they were wrapped like an empty cocoon, John 20. There were confirmed appearances as the handouts that you should all have. 
If anyone missed the handout and there's, you need, we need more, we can provide it. There were eyewitness accounts. Um, they correspond with one another. Um, Mike, what are the odds of getting three people in a room sharing an account and all of them agreeing if it's fake? Not very good, is it? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So, and the accounts are numerous. So, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul reminds readers that many of the witnesses were still alive that that could be questioned. More than 500 witnesses. If you were to allow just six minutes of cross-examination or testimony, that would equal over 50 hours of testimony. Uh, that wouldn't be much for cross-examination, actually. That would be just give their statements. Plus many more separate witnesses and occasions um, of a variety of people. So meantime, though, also the critics were silent. That's another key thing to look at. Is there's not a lot historically written to debunk it. But one of the main things that happened were the changed lives. Um, James, Jesus' brother, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, shows what happened with him. Acts chapter 1. The disciples... At first they fled. They remember at the, at the crucifixion, they were in hiding. They took off. John, John came around. He showed up with Mary for a time. They all, they all fled, and yet they all died martyrs' deaths. They all died martyrs' deaths for a lie. John was traditional, tradition tells us, was boiled in oil, but he lived. So people can... People can and are martyred for something that's not true, but if they're the perpetrators of a hoax, do you think they're all going to be martyred for it? And what are the odds of that? Especially all of them? You might find one that's kind of insane enough. Um, Peter had denied him three times. He died a martyr's death. Others hid in an upper room and behind locked doors. And then you have Paul. He had Paul's conversion. Paul was not persecuting Christians. But he talked to somebody on the road to Damascus, didn't he? So what that means, what that means for us, of course, is because he rose, we rose, we will rise too. We know that from 1 Corinthians 15. It's such a key passage. You learn it, read through the whole thing. Romans chapter 8. I want to turn to Romans chapter 8 real quick. Starting verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The law of Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity with God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I'm going to put down a couple more verses up here real quick, too. Magic eraser. Mm -hmm. 
Ephesians 2, 1 to 6. Colossians 3, 1 to 17. And about our living hope, Christ our living hope, 1 Peter, hope you can read my chicken scratches, 1, 3. I wanted to do one more, one more quick thing. Let's see if I got time. I got time. I think I need... It's not a magic trick. I'm not going to hurt. I think I need... Maybe two volunteers, two helpers real quick. Okay. You heard me mention the Shroud of Turin. I don't know if you know this or not, but at one time there were, at one time there were um, no fewer than 40 shrouds on display around the world. Now, the shot of turn would be a cool thing, and if a lot of people want to put a lot of stock in it, and it'd be cool if, if it were real and if you had all this evidence for it, but it can also make us kind of a mockery if it's demonstrably, if it's demonstrably, demonstrably proven to be false. It makes us look like a bunch of buffoons, right? And we don't want that. Okay, so... You've seen the Shroud of Turin, and it looks kind of like a photograph. I don't know if any of you ever starting on about the 90s, they used to have these simulation games, sim games with people. And at the time, you could skin a sim. In other words, you could put your own face, your own picture on a sim and make yourself walking around in this little game. So you'd import a photo, and when it made the photo, and you had a photo flattened out, it looked really odd and disturbing because you're going from 3D to, to two dimensions, right? All right. So who wants... I need, I need two people up here. This is what I'll, so, you don't get, so you don't get marked on. I'll do it on myself even, okay? I'll take my glasses off. So I'm going to demonstrate this, okay? So what I want you to do is, real, is not too deep and don't hold it too long because I don't want purple on my skin. But take this and kind of real quick do a circle around my ear and then maybe a dot where my eyes are and then maybe a little happy mouth on me, okay? On this paper towel, though, not on me. Okay? And you, and you might have to help me hold this a little bit, make sure you get it straight. On, on here, I don't know if I... Is this on me good? Okay. Okay, get my ears. You can see where my ears are right here right between my fingers? Just do an outline. An outline on this side. Okay. All right, now. Cool. So here's my face in three dimensions. So if you take the shroud of Jesus, if he was really wrapped in it, and you were ready to take a 3D shroud of Jesus and unwrap it and lay it flat, here's how wide his ears would be. You see how the shroud of turn cannot have been wrapped around Jesus' face in three dimensions. It just doesn't. Three dimensions, flat. That was a bonus, by the way. It was just a little extra. All right. So that's it. That's, that's the end of the lesson. Uh, did everybody get one of these? I can make sure I've got your email address if you didn't get one or if you need one, and I'll make sure that you get a copy of the Resurrection Appearances. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, guys, for your help.